Welcome to Magic Arcanum. I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Letson, and we are so glad you are here because it's story time. Liliana Vess is one of the most complex characters in the Magic story and one of my personal favorites, but Core Set 2021 doesn't tell you a lot about her. So for today's flavor win, we're going to take a look at some of her cards and then try to put them into a deck for Magic Arena. But first, a big thank you to my patrons who make this all possible, of course. Now, I do read every comment, and I know some viewers are eager for me to get back to the bigger story pieces, and those will happen again, I want to make that clear. But for right now, during the core set summer, I kind of wanted to focus on the monocolored planeswalkers and provide a sort of introduction to these characters for anyone new to the game or has been playing for a while and is just getting curious about the stories. Okay, okay, so who is Liliana? Where does she come from? And what is up with that horseshoe shaped headband thing she's always wearing? As always, we'll start with the basics. Liliana Vess is a human planeswalker from Dominaria. She is centered in black mana, and she is one of the most powerful necromancers in the multiverse. She also happens to be over 100 years old, which makes her a pre-mending planeswalker. In an effort to recover some of her lost power, she made a deal with four demons to trade her soul for eternal youth and beauty. Now, I covered this extensively in one of my earlier videos called The Best Deal in Magic, so go back and check that one out if you haven't already. Liliana first appeared in the 2007 set Lorwyn as one of the game's original five planeswalkers. That version didn't have anything to do with zombies, but it is quite similar to the version of her we just got in Corset 2021. That is Liliana Waker of the Dead, and it depicts her after the events of War of the Spark, in which Gideon sacrificed himself to save her from the wrath of Nicol Bolas. Liliana is now trying to come to terms with her place in the multiverse. Her whole life has been one ruthless quest for power, and she would walk over anybody to get it. I guess I better back up a bit. As a child on Dominaria, Liliana's life was pretty good. Her father was a powerful general who ruled a portion of Benalia. This did make him and his family targets, however, and indeed, Liliana's brother Josu was poisoned by these outside forces, leaving Liliana in a desperate search for a way to heal him. While out looking for a specific herb, Liliana encountered the Raven Man, who encouraged her to use her necromantic magic to grow one from a dead root. Believing that this man was a supporter of her father, she took his advice and gave the treatment to Josu. Now, this Raven Man is a huge mystery in the magic story, too much to get into for this video. But rest assured, when he appears again in the future, and I'm sure he will, we will then devote some time to talking about him. For today, we just need to know that the cure was worse than the disease, and poor Josu went mad from it. He started attacking the servants in the Vess family manner, leaving Liliana with no choice but to reanimate a few of them as zombies to stop her rampaging brother. This traumatic event ignited Liliana's spark and took her on her first random planeswalk, bringing her to Innistrad. From there, she would eventually go on to acquire the Chain Veil, use it to curse Garrick Wildspeaker, have an on-again, off-again relationship with Jace, join the Gatewatch, kill the four demons who signed her contract, and then lead the Dreadhorde army onto Ravnica under the direct control of Nicol Bolas during the War of the Spark. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> And I promise in future videos, we will cover those events in more detail. But for today, we're just going to look at the cards from Corset 2021, because those are the ones that are going to go into our Flavor Wind deck. I'll start with Liliana's Devotee. Just like how young Pyromancer mimics Chandra, this warlock is doing his junior impression of Liliana. He can create zombie tokens at the end of your turn if something has died, and he gives them some extra power. The art kind of reminds me of Bog Raiders. I think it's the cheek bone? 
Anyway, zombies are a very interesting part of magic because as far as I can tell, they are created differently from every other creature you summon. This question comes up a lot. How do planeswalkers summon creatures? Do they pull them from their native plane to wherever the battle is happening? Well, the best answer we have comes from Ajani's pride mate in War of the Spark. The flavor text here says planeswalkers create replicas of allies. So they are in effect creating a new body using pure mana that looks and acts like a creature or person that they have encountered at least once before. For zombies though, the implication is that Liliana really does return a dead creature back to life. In one of the stories, there's a bit where she's searching the ground for a while before saying, ah, here we go. And then everyone looks at her funny as she waits for two deeply buried corpses to dig their way back up to the surface. Now, obviously the game treats them all the same, the cards, no matter where they come from. But I thought it was interesting that in the lore, summoned creatures versus zombified creatures are created differently. Anyway, Liliana's standard bearer. A standard is a military flag displayed on a pole or a rope specifically. And we've had those in magic before. The flavor text on this guy tells us that purple is the color of House Vess, and it represents death whenever it is flown. This is curious to me because Liliana's father was a respected member of society, and I don't think the flag would have meant death back in his day. More likely, that came about much, much later when those colors were flown by Liliana's brother as he served the Cabal. Oh, that's right. Josu Vess was turned into a Lich Knight and had his own army of zombies based in the then crumbling Vess Manor long after Liliana had fled Dominaria. She did eventually return and lay him to rest, but by then her family reputation was ruined and the Vess name was synonymous with death. So that leaves us with the last showcase card, Liliana's Steward. And again, this one confuses me. Liliana came home to Dominaria during the set, Dominaria, and she confronted Josu and the demon Belzenlock. But at this point, her family home was described as being in ruins thanks to decades of neglect. After the War of the Spark, she returned to Dominaria again, but this time found the house to be immaculate because someone had moved in and was pretending to be Liliana Vess. This imposter was empowered by a djinn living inside her magical necklace, but eventually the real Liliana was able to overthrow her thanks to some help from her new friends, Teo and Kaya. So I guess now the manor is in great shape, but it should be empty. Liliana did not stay on Dominaria, and she did not reclaim the family home as her own. When she lived on Innistrad, she did have a home full of zombies and other loyal servants, but it was never referred to as Vess Manor. So I am not clear how this guy fits into the established lore, but I do know we have to fit him into our flavor wind deck. Oh, oh, I did say I would tell you where she got that headdress, which also appears in the bottom of the showcase card frames. She took that from an angel she met on Innistrad because for some reason, Liliana really hates angels. I mean, she really hates them. And it's not like they ever did anything to her. I think early on they just wanted to show what an evil and cruel person she was, and they figured the best way to do that was to have her outwardly hate the one universal symbol of purity and goodness, and then steal its headband. So that is the origin of that. Longtime fans of Arcana might remember that my favorite way to examine a character is to ask two simple questions. What does this person want? And what are they willing to do to get it. For Liliana, you can get a good sense of the answer to those questions by looking at her cards over the years. And we're gonna try to do that really fast, like within the next mustache minute or so. Ready? Here we go. OG Liliana Vess. Doesn't mention zombies, but does dig through your deck to find the most powerful card. And that feels pretty black if it doesn't pass the necromancer smell test, which is a terrible test, by the way. Liliana of the Veil, probably her most famous iteration. It still has nothing to do with zombies, but the way it can make your opponent sacrifice half their permanence lines up nicely with how she did almost the same thing to Thalia in the story. This is a very good card, and it is definitely worth... $50! Liliana of the Dark Realms. Search for swamps, use swamps to affect creatures, and use swamps to make more mana. 
this version feels nothing like Liliana, but was somehow printed in back-to-back -back core sets. Liliana Heretical Healer. Get Gordon Ramsay in here because finally, some good food. The art shows Vess Manor, and the card tells the story of her spark igniting as she thinks she watches Josu die, and there are zombies on the front and back of this thing. This might be one of my favorite magic cards of all time. Liliana the Last Hope. We are in the golden age of Liliana card designs, and going forward, they are almost all going to mention zombies from here on out. She is at the height of her magical powers. She has the chain veil, and she has the gate watch under her thumb after rescuing them from Emrakul. This is peak Liliana, and I love it. Liliana Death's Majesty. Ah, the pride cometh before the fall. This is right before she and her new friends lost to Nicol Bolas on Amonkhet because she was so concerned with killing her remaining demons, she did not leave anything in the tank for her fight against the Elder Dragon when he arrived for the Hour of Devastation. Liliana Untouched by Death. This is an interesting one because she cannot create any zombies on her own and is entirely at the mercy of the composition of the rest of your deck. It is a very on-rails card, but I think it's one of the best of her designs for the core set because you can look at this thing and tell immediately what kind of support it needs to be effective. Liliana Dreadhorde General, with a static ability that rewards you for death, and activated abilities that can create zombies and force things to get sacrificed. This is another version of Liliana that really shows you what this character wants and what they're willing to do to get it. Now, by this point in the story, Liliana becomes confused about what she wants and is even less sure how to get it, which kind of leads us into her newest card from M21. Liliana, Waker of the Dead. I believe this title has two meanings. Yes, she does literally wake dead creatures. She makes them into zombies. That's her magic. That's how it works. Pretty on the nose. But she has also undergone an awakening of her own self. Part of her identity has been dead inside ever since she fled her family home and became a planeswalker. As a child, she studied to be a healer, and she only dabbled in the necromantic arts, believing that it might make her healing magic more effective. Gideon sacrificed himself because he believed there was still good in Liliana. He thought she still had the capacity to help and heal people rather than step over them on her way to power. So now we're at a major turning point for Liliana. Her demons are dead and she is free of the contract she had with Nicol Bolas, but she is still being held responsible for a lot of the death and destruction on Ravnica. For over a hundred years, all Liliana wanted was to be at the top of her game. And now that she's there, she is finding it to be very, very lonely. So, what is she willing to do about it? We probably won't find out until at least next year, but my guess is she goes back to Dominaria and possibly even interacts with Basri, as his teachings of solidarity and togetherness bring her out of the shadows and further into the light. As has become tradition, we need to cast our live-action magic movie. And for me, there is no better Liliana than Eva Grain. Now, I know somebody's going to try and sell me on Angelina Jolie, but no. Liliana is a character of contradictions. She wants to live forever, but she uses death as her protector. You need someone who can convey that sense of vulnerability, of frailty as they hide behind their army of shambling corpses. I think Angelina is just too powerful for that. So yeah, my vote is Eva, but if you need further convincing, go watch her in the excellent Penny Dreadful, because that is basically Innistrad the series. All right, for the rest of my Liliana trivia and musings, you'll have to stick with me as we switch over to Magic Arena and take a look at the Flavorwind deck. Here we go. Okay, so here is the Flavor Wind deck for Liliana. It's a standard deck again. I know some people have been asking for Brawl. We'll probably do that on a future episode, but for today, I thought uh, standard would work best. So let's take a quick look at the list. We've got four Liliana Stewards. We've also got a pair of Foulmeyer Knights. These are gonna be great for card draw. The Death Touch uh, is also really handy at keeping back anything that's too big for our zombies to really deal with. We've got some removal in the form of Eliminates and Heartless Acts. 
We've got some Eternal Taskmasters in here. Uh, these can get creatures back out of our own graveyard. Uh, they're also just a really oversized body for their cost. Bit of a downside coming into play tapped. So that's why there's only a pair of them in here. Plus multiples don't really stack up that well. You're not gonna use their ability more than once a turn. Lazatep Reavers. Um, uh, kind of stretching the flavor a little bit, although Liliana did control the uh, the Dreadhorde army on Ravnica. Uh, these aren't you know pure zombies in the sense that we like to see with the rest of her cards, but I like how this one creates two bodies that are both zombies. That actually plays really great when you follow it up with Liliana's Devotee because then they both get the extra attack power. Uh, we'll come back to him in a second. We also have some Liliana's Triumph in here, which I think is a pretty good flavor win. Uh, we've got the DOTs, like I said. These guys are excellent, kind of the whole point of the deck. We wanna go wide with as many zombies as we can and then attack with that extra power. I also like how he can create new zombie tokens at the end of the turn whenever something dies. We can force something to die with our own steward by sacrificing it, uh, for example, or just by attacking recklessly, which is kind of fun. We got a couple of standard bearers in here to refill our hand if we need it. Also some insurance against uh, like a board wipe or something if we manage to keep some mana up to flash this guy in after getting hit by Shatter the Sky. That can help refill our hand. Murderous Riders are a premium card. These are great. Um, the ability to destroy creatures or planeswalkers. The lifelink is going to kind of help keep us alive against some of the more aggressive decks as well, especially when they become 3 threes thanks to the Devotee. And then we've got Liliana herself. This is, uh, you know, the whole point of the deck, uh, even though she does not actually make zombies. She does like to have things in the graveyard, and she can uh, force our opponent to discard their best cards and then hopefully bring them back with that minus seven emblem. They're building some new houses just up the road for me, so there's construction vehicles driving back and forth all the time. Sorry if you can hear that. Uh, basic lands, just some swamps. There's not really a good swamp that shows Dominaria right now. Uh, most of them kind of focus on like Urborg and some of the creepier places, but nothing really where Liliana was from. So we're just using the full arts here. And then we did have some room for Radiant Fountain, which again, not super flavorful. Uh, although her having eternal youth and, and life and things like that, the gaining two life kind of fits. And the fountain itself could be a part of her Vest family manor, maybe. Uh, probably should be something like Castle Lockthwain in here, but that felt a little too far outside of what I was comfortable with. Uh, so that is the deck. We are going to see how this one performs as we try to get some flavor wins with our Go Wide Zombie Army. Here we go. All right, here we go. We got our Liliana Flavor Win deck. We've got a pair of lands, uh, which is probably fine. We got some early action. As long as we pick up a third land, we'll be in really great shape. So let's keep it and see how we do. And we get to go first. So we will lead off with Liliana's Steward. All right, so we are playing against... Erebus, 1975. He's got at least 10 years on me, age-wise, which is fine. Uh, oh, boy. Well, let's just get in there with our little steward, poke him with your candlestick, get some reinforcements with the Reaver. And now, hopefully, we find that third land, because then we'll have a quite good board. But if we do not, uh, we're still okay. All right, so we are up against a flash deck that is playing on its own turn. We did not hit our third land. But I think it's still as safe to attack here with everything, right? I mean, I don't expect him to trade, but maybe. Okay, so... Another Reaver gives us a body to block with and makes our standing zombie army a little bit bigger. So somebody asked why I have the name Mage Zyron in the comments on a previous video. That's just Ryan Gomez with the letters all scrambled up. It's like a Tom Riddle, I am Voldemort thing that just worked out for me. Pretty cool. Uh, opponent does nothing. Gee, I wonder if they are going to flash something in this time uh, or counterspell. Either would be not great, but we're going to try to buff up our team with Liliana's devotee. Is that a French word? Does French exist in the magic universe? I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll just slam in there with everybody. I think at this point we're just racing to do as much damage as we can. Spectral Sailor. Interesting. All right. So even with that, they still don't block. All right. Opponent down to seven. We're at 22. I think right now we're going to watch out for... Well, what? What could they do? If they played a fourth land, I guess I'd be worried about a board wipe, but... Does the flash day? They can see! There's our first flavor win! Boy, that was pretty quick. Uh, I think we can try that again. Let's see what else we got. 
Okay, we have three swamps, some removal, some bigger zombies. Uh, not exactly the barn burner start that I would hope for, but we'll see what we can do. We are playing against Eaglet. Is that like a baby eagle? Yeah. Uh, all right, planes into Flourishing Fox. So this is going to be the cycling deck, which is tough. So do we just Heartless Act this thing now before it gets counters on it? Or we can eliminate it later, so that's actually fine. So we'll instead start with Taskmaster, uh, who comes in tapped, but that's okay. We're under no real pressure here yet. Usually they, they would open on like a cycling land if they had one, I think. I don't know, I feel like this deck has kind of fallen out of favor lately. I don't usually see the cycling decks. Um, wow, and no cycle. Okay. So we could... Play one of our devotees and make this into a 3-3. We could eliminate this guy before he starts making any tokens. Or we should probably Heartless Act it, actually. Let's do that. Let's do that. And that way we can save Eliminate for the Fox, no matter how big it gets. All right, 1918, keeping on pace here. Um, interesting that they did not play the Stinger, because that tends to do a fair chunk of damage over time. Instead, they are going all in on this fox. All all in on this fox. All right, so we're taking a little bite of damage here, but that is actually fine because we are just gonna straight up eliminate this guy now. I mean, there was the option to play Liliana there, but she would not have been able to get rid of the fox. And I think this is better. All right, so now, now we can play Liliana. And we will each discard. I don't think we need two of these guys. Although two of them together is pretty good, but I'm okay letting one go. If we need to, we can get it back with him later. But not this turn, because that's it costs three mana to get something back out of your graveyard, which is not unreasonable, but Alright, so opponent on fifth land still hasn't really done anything. Zenith Flare is one of the scariest cards still, and I mean this graveyard has already got a ton of cycling stuff in it. <laughs> what did I just why do I always do that? Every time I <clears throat> Okay. So let's just Perfect. We have six lands, we can Play the devotee, bring back the other one. And now we'll see what our opponent has on their side. Another land. And a single justice strike. Not a problem. Hmm. So the devotees together don't really uh, do a lot because they don't buff each other up because they're not zombies themselves. But it's fine. <clears throat> I guess playing that one before combat wasn't... whatever. Um, I've not seen a board wipe from this deck. I don't think that they have one. So I think we're okay just running out all of our cards, right? Surely I won't get punished this time, right? Pyromancer, yeah. That's also a weird inclusion for this deck. I've not seen that. Uh, hey, but guess what? She costs three mana or less, so she is eliminated. Do you ever watch Most Extreme Elimination Challenge? Don't get eliminated! Love it. Love it, love it, love it. All right. Get in there, my fancy dressed friends. Okay. Something died this turn. We can make a zombie. How many times can we do this? Two times. I'll take it. Wow, we now have lethal on board. If they don't have another... Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Still have lethal. They need a Zenith Flare again. Or some blockers. Or they can just cycle away, something that could have blocked. They are going all in on the cycling. Well, they have two cards left in hand. They are going to concede! They cannot beat Liliana and her zombies. That is two flavor wins in a row. Should we try for one more? Let's try for one more. Let's get the Lily trifecta. Here we go. All right, one more shot at a flavor win with Liliana. I would love to get a third win here and make her the most winning deck we've had yet. That'd be cool. We got some early action, some removal, and Liliana herself. I mean, we got to keep that seven, right? We are playing against Blue-ez. Blue-threes. I don't know. We've 
Got the Ajani Avatar. And red, but no one drop. I will take it. That could be a free turn. That could make the whole difference by the end of this game. All right, so we've got enough lands now to eventually get Liliana. They now have two mountains, and they're passing. Sure. This just gets better and better for us. All right, we will hold the fountain as late as we can so they don't know that we have extra life. Uh, this steward doing work here. Candlestick of death. Get him. Pow. All right. So next turn we could play Lily. Probably ditch our own swamp. Ah, they are a red and white deck. They are interesting. Skylight Legionnaire. So he's got haste. All right. Uh, so you can attack with that. I think we are just going to destroy it right now, though. So now that we know they have haste things, I am a little less eager to drop Liliana out here. But we'll see. We'll keep him as a blocker just in case they have something on the ground. Um, this battle is going to end on my... And we'll give up a swamp because this deck curves out at four. She is our biggest card, so I don't really need more than four mana necessarily. And they ditched Cosmotronic Wave. Very cool. All right, blue threes, blue as. Uh, we have a very nice looking Boros Legion deck here. All right, doesn't have haste, doesn't have haste, very cool. Uh, so we can eliminate probably the flying threat. And then we could, we could just get rid of this guy too, yeah. As much as I love ticking up Liliana, I think I want to keep both the cards in my hand. So we will get rid of that. Play some more Zombinos. And now we can get one more attack with our Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast. Oh no, they found a hasty flying boy. Oh, that's going to be the death of Liliana. So sad. So sad. My queen. All right. Rider and a Triumph. That would have been great. Oh, missed it by, missed it by that much. All right, what do we got here? A two-three Poros Mentor. And this is just going to keep walloping us. So let's make them get rid of their last card, because I like doing that. Now they're in strict top deck mode. It was a sure strike. Fine. We could then force them to sacrifice something, or we could just straight up kill whichever one we like. Killing. Let's get this guy off the ground. Because now we have a clean attack. And if they draw like a land here, we can just make a... Yes! So now we can make them sacrifice. All right, we get a little bit more life. We empty out their side of the board. We bring down our murderous rider. And now we have three zombies to their empty board. We are ahead 20 to 13, and they are now hitting their lands. I have a good feeling about this. This could be a third flavor win, and Liliana's been having such a tough year. You know, she really deserves this. Uh, fine. So Taskmaster, when he attacks, we get to bring back the steward, I guess, is our only option. So do we just throw everything in here and attack? I guess we do. He's probably going to block something small, or what? He could pump this, right? He could make that big enough to kill somebody. That's fine. That's fine. We still outnumber him. Who's he going to block, though? The rider? He's going to stop me from getting Taskmaster triggers. Okay. Uh, sure. 26 to 5. Very close to our third flavor win for Liliana. Zombies going wide. Crushing the Boros Legion just like we wanted. He makes an attack. No blocks. Is this... Is this a... Sure. We are going to die with more life than we started with. And for giggles, we could even just rider that guy. But we will just swing in here with the zombie team. Pew, pew, pew. Xaxes, flavor win, number three for Liliana. That was so cool. I love the zombies going wide. 
getting in there and clawing people's faces apart. If you like this one, let me know down in the comments, then make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss more flavor wins that you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We still got Chandra and Garrick coming up, and then we'll get back to doing some regular story videos. But for this core set, I really wanted to give each Planeswalker their own chance to kind of shine here on Flavor Win Season 1. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I will see you guys out there. Be safe and be well. We'll see ya.